But I'm Rookie Nuhol Ravikumar, Director of Education at the museum, and I'm going to be the moderator, or I have the joy and honor of being the moderator of this conversation with Tobias Frere Jones, the winner of our Communication Design Award, and Susan Kerr, winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award. Since we have only 20 minutes, I'm going to jump right in. But we're going to focus on points, pikas, pixels, and other details of their work. So jumping in, when you meet a stranger, how do you explain what you do? I'll start with you, Susan. We'll have oh. you hold up your mic. Oh, and sorry. Yeah. Um, I usually say that I'm a user interface graphic designer because I think about being a designer as solving a problem that someone else creates, as opposed to when you're an artist, you can think up your own problem and solve it. And I would never say that I'm a user interface designer because I think that's collaborative with engineers and product designers. So it's kind of long, but that it qualifies it. Tobias, what about you? Uh, well, these, these days I tell people that I make fonts and, uh, and, and just ask, uh, um, ask them if you, you know that menu in your, your Microsoft Word, like those things, yeah, I make those, and try to connect this to uh, as closely as possible to something that they know so that this isn't some, this doesn't sound like some abstract, distant thing. Could you each recall a project that you worked on where the details make all the difference? I'll start with you again, Susan. I think I would be hard pressed to think of a project where the details didn't make all the difference. It's kind of all of the above. Just because when I started out where I lived was a 16 by 16, you know, what can you make in 16 by 16 squares where, um, Here's a little puzzle to solve. And sometimes I make little portraits that are 32 by 32. And it's amazing. I mean, you have a 1,000 dots, so um, choices to make, black or white. But um, it's amazing how just when you're trying to do resemblance or a mouth, just one or versus two pixels up or down one pixel, um, sometimes you're trying to get it, and the spark of resemblance happens with the tiniest adjustment. But in, in almost everything, it's like a little curve or a color or um, just a, the nuance of something when you're working small makes a big difference, probably just like you. Uh, yes, I was. Um I would say that details are pretty much everything that I do. Um, the the one I think just, uh, I think good example of that uh, uh, would be Retina that uh, I made for the Wall Street Journal to be used in their um, in their stock listings at about I think it was five and a quarter point on newsprint. Uh, this, is, this is a very small size in this very difficult environment, and in that. Uh, in that sort of uh, situation, you know whether the uh, you know the jaws of the sea were a little bit more open or a little bit more closed, uh, it could be the difference between that character you know filling in and, and turning into uh, or appearing to be an O or a, a three blurring into being an eight. Uh, so it, that was those are especially high stakes for uh, you know very small moves with with each one of these shapes. You know, what struck me with both of your work is beyond that great attention to detail that you both pay, you take a lot of research, a lot of information, and you seem to distill it down into, in your case, Susan, a simple mark, or with you, a simple expression. And I'm thinking about the work that you did for the Grand Central typeface. Will you tell us a little bit about what all of that background was that you looked at? Uh, sure. The, the the brief for the the typeface that I did for Grand Central Terminal was to uh, make a typeface that uh, not really emulated but uh, or emulated and summed up uh, the 
hand-painted lettering from the original state of the station from 1913. Um, and the, the sign painters had a style, but that style would be adapted to uh, each sort of uh, location uh, throughout the building, whether it was this long panel over the ticket windows or uh, the side of a column on the way to one of the platforms. So this, there wasn't any fixed form that I could go refer to. It was the sort of cloud of things that were looked sort of similar, and it was sort of hard to say what the center of that uh, uh, cloud was. Um, it was also made more difficult by the fact that a lot of it was gone, and I had to just, uh, look up archive photos and hope that there, that a bit of lettering happened to show up in one of the pictures, uh, because no one was taking pictures of the lettering. No one thought that was important enough. Um, but uh, to fill in all of these gaps, I had to research what what sign painters were doing at that time, sort of what else would be in their uh, repertoire uh, that resembled this, um, and and try to extrapolate from that. How did you take all of that and get it to one typeface? Uh, it, it was a lot of a lot of trial and error, uh, but it was also uh, sort of living inside this for long enough that I could uh, do a sort of, I don't know, kind of bit of sort of character acting to imagine uh, what this design would uh, uh, behave like and try to uh, imagine you know, what this sign painter would do with this kind of shape or, or that kind of shape. And you know, there's no, uh, I mean, I didn't find any ampersand or a dollar sign or, or a, any of these other. Uh, or quote marks, or question marks, or anything, any of these other things that a typeface needs. But after having lived inside it for long enough, I feel confident to uh, you know, make my extrapolation of what that would be and what would fit there and be in character. Susan, I'm thinking about some of your projects that you did with Apple, where they look really simple, but when you were talking about it, it looked like there was a ton of research and information behind it. Will you share some of your um, examples and stories with us? Um, thanks for asking. Um, I mean, I worked at Apple in the early 80s, shortly after the Earth cooled. And it, <laughs> it, it, I think for me it was one of those situations where you don't know what you don't know. So um, it, was like, it was like, make a typeface that's nine dots high and five dots wide. So I looked at existing examples and I could see, I mean, a big leap forward with the Mac was having type that wasn't confined to the same width for every character. So you had those really skinny M's and um, we had the luxury of variable width. So um, I didn't even realize how um, freeing that was. So a, a lot of the stuff I did, I just kind of sat down and did it. Um, with the icons, the engineers that I worked with, because I was a member of the software group, and it's funny when you said, what did you call yourself? My business card said Macintosh artist, which I loved. <laughs> and um, they would build um, a working version of the system software constantly. So I was able to try out different, different things, sort of informal qualitative research. And um, things just stuck. So I would, I, I think it was a good project because it's always possible to design. You don't have to be a user of it to be, if you understand all the information. But since this was a computer intended for people to be friendly and for people that didn't really know about computers, I was the perfect um, subject because that was me. So it was easy to try to think about how to communicate more arcane concepts and technical things with metaphors that people would get. You know, you said something um, a couple of days ago when we were chatting about your work that completely blew my mind. And you said, actually, going simple is in some ways inclusive. 
Will you explain that a little bit more for our audience here? Um, I, I know that sounds a little bit counter to some trends now to have very um, a huge range of very specific things that you can choose, but it's just like a pencil. If you just outline a little tool for writing, it's pretty recognizable. And I like to think that the lack of detail makes things more universal because with resolution in the same um, pixel density, you could draw a chrome pen that has a reflection in it. But maybe that tool, that, that detail makes it very recognizable to someone, but um, such a specific thing that someone else might never have encountered that thing. So um, actually, there's a book, Understanding Comics, that talks about um, Scott McCloud, fantastic book about UI, even though it's meant for comics. But he shows the a kind of a progression of a man's face from like an ink drawing, very detailed, looks like somebody specific, down to just a circle with a smile and two dots. And he explains how everyone can project themselves onto the smile with two dots. You don't have to think about gender or any other specifics. So I think with the Mac, where it was pretty low res and black and white, that was sort of what you had to do by default. But I still think now there's great value in that um, for in, in an attempt to make things that cross cultures and barriers. Yeah, I, I think we just don't think about that these days. We somehow think more detail is needed to help everyone feel included. And you made me think about things I in know. a If I ran things, I, I'd probably be <laughs> controversial, but the other way. So to, how has changing and advances in technology affected both your worlds and the kind of work you do? Uh, I think in, in my case, it's the the advances of uh, the font formats or the, the tools that we use to make type uh, have, have made a lot of this much easier. Um, and uh, you know, the, the things that I had wanted to do for uh, quite a long time are much easier than, than they had been for a long time. Like to, you know, uh, to add in support for, um, you know, uh, more languages or uh, sort of a larger character set, small caps, old style figures, fractions, all these other things that were kind of awkward in, um, in old postscript faces, you know, that from the 80s and 90s. Um, but it's also raised the expectations of users. So, so we can do more, but we're also expected to do more. Uh, so in, in some ways it kind of nets out to being the same amount of work um, and, and payoff. But uh, it, it, in the end, it's, it's a good thing that you know, it's, uh, it, it's not as, um, it's a bit harder to keep, to keep the typefaces simple now because there's so many things can be added uh, that uh, it's, we have to uh, often have to think of ways to simplify this and, and focus the, the idea down because it could get so uh, sort of overwrought and overcomplicated. Give us an example. So when you say more things can be added. Uh, with this, I, you know, I could make a typeface with you know, 15 alternates for every letter. Um, I could do that. It would be kind of <laughs> nuts. Um, uh, and you know, maybe someone would really enjoy that. But um, it would. Uh, there's sort of temptations everywhere to to go off in all these different directions because now there's space for it. So a lot of restraint on your part. I think Susan would really like you to make a typeface with 15 different alternatives. Uh, okay, all right. I can handle it. Okay, sure. All right. Okay. What about you, Susan? Um, I think it's a very good question because with the 
just as Tobias said, with the advent of, if you're thinking about a symbol, let's say the tools and the bandwidth enable color and animation and sound. And I think sometimes there's a tendency to, if you have a million colors, you don't need to use them all in every project and have every icon jump up and down just because you can. Um, I think sometimes there's some gratuitous, um, not quite show off, but just this um, expectation that, oh, modern things incorporate all every technological advance. But I think about like an example might be, there's a street sign for school crossing and it's kind of shaped like a house and it's yellow and it has a silhouette, a lot of them with a boy and girl holding hands. And there's no real technological reason that thing couldn't be 3D and the kids could have plaid lunch boxes. And if you went close to it, you could hear them talking about their homework. And, <laughs> but, but like, why? You, it, it, would, it, would, it would impede, I think, your quick recognition at a glance. So I think restraint is a really good thing. That being said, having like 20 levels of undo, it, you know, makes life easier in the creation of things. So you, Susan, have been credited with giving the, the Macintosh its smile. Um, the more I looked at your work, it was really less about pixels and technology and more about people and emotion and meaning. And you made me think about why do we use the magnifying glass to search for things? Will you tell us about that a little bit more? I mean, in the work I do, or I think if you want to be an icon designer, it's good to think about craft, and it's good to think about metaphor, because um, there are, it's not an exact science, but you really want to think about what is the symbol. So sometimes, I kind of wonder about the magnifying glass. There was a magnifying glass in Macintosh, and it meant enlarge. It's in Mac Paint. Because when you search with that sense of looking for something, I just don't think you go out on Madison Avenue and see a bunch of people with magnifying <laughs> glasses when they're looking for shoes. It, it just, it, there's some, I usually think, well, it's maybe when you're looking for bugs and you want to, so, Sometimes some of these things, I think it's always worth keeping your mind open that there might be a better metaphor for things. Like maybe an eye with a slash through it isn't the best thing for hide. I always think ouch when I see that. But um, it, it, it's funny how some things get adopted and then they just keep going and you wonder why. In terms of wondering why, Tobias, have you designed for in non-Latin typefaces and what would that experience be like or have you always done Latin-based typefaces? Uh, I've, I've done a few typefaces in, in Greek and Cyrillic, which are the close cousins to Latin and, and share uh, some history and uh, a number of the forms. Um, when a project uh, goes beyond that, in whether it's you know, for Arabic or the Hindi or Japanese, ch Chinese, something. Uh, I you know, work with colleagues to you know, find, you know, either uh, work with them to draw that part of uh, that part of the character set to be sure that uh, these these forms are going through the hands of a native speaker. Uh, so I won't presume to. Um, you know, know exactly what these sh should be like, um, and I've I, I feel comfortable doing Greek and Cyrillic on my own only because I've I've done it uh, many times over and spent a lot of time consulting with native speakers that have managed to uh, absorb all the things that I've heard from them. Um, but you know, I haven't uh, you know done enough projects in Hindi or Korean or anything else. Uh, to be able to do that on my own, and I think it's important to, uh, you know, be aware of you know what I know and what I don't know, and and not 
you know, presume to walk in and know what this should be. That's really well said, to be aware of what we know and don't know. Um, it's been fascinating to spend some time with your work and get to know the details behind what you do. I hope you've all enjoyed hearing a little bit more about how they approach their work, um, how they look at the world, and what they're thinking about. Um, congratulations again to the two of you for your awards. Thank you. And thank you all for coming, and we hope you gain a deeper appreciation of the work that they do, and enjoy the rest of the programs today. Thank you again. Thank you.